Yes, I used to be an academic before I joined Microsoft, so uh, uh, I'm particularly interested in open access uh, to publications as well as data. But today we're going to say something about some of the work we've been doing on reproducible research uh, and the context of which it's in, which is data-intensive scientific discovery. So some of the topics, I'll just touch on these. So the scientific data deluge to start off with. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, in all fields, I think we're seeing uh, an explosion of data. It doesn't have to be up at the petabyte range. It could actually just be, you know, uh, large numbers of uh, gigabytes, uh, large numbers of files, large numbers of small experiments. It depends what scientific field you're working in. So people like the particle physics uh, and astronomers, they have large, huge amounts of petabytes of data, but even chemists have, uh, have significant sums of data and significant management problems in dealing with data. So we are having a large amount of data. This is typified by genome. Uh, it used to be $3 billion. It's, it's now something in this region, uh, a few thousand dollars. And, uh, you know, before very long, in a couple of years, it's going to be, uh, we can all have our genome sequenced for a few hundred dollars. And why is that interesting? Well, I think it's yet to be proved, but the pharmaceutical people are very interested because uh, uh, it turns out that if you have codeine, for example, for headaches or whatever, 10% of the people don't respond to it. And if you could find out which those 10% were by looking at their genetic profile, then you could give them some other drug. Now, that's codeine, but there's also cancer drugs. It's, it turns out that 40% you know, of people don't respond to cancer drugs, and if you could find out which ones, or if there's side effects, and you could find out what the genetic profile. So it's not too far-fetched that this personalized medicine in your drugstore, you'll go and get a little test, and they'll say, well, in that case, you need this medicine rather than this medicine. So that's what the pharmaceutical companies are, are excited about. These are the big, big, uh, big data people in science. Uh, in 2000, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey collected more data in its first week and was collected in the entire history of astronomy. This is what The Economist said, anyway. But, but certainly by, well, it says 2016. I suspect it will be a little later than that. The large synoptic survey telescope in Chile will apply, you know, 140 terabytes in five days, more than the Sloan Digital Sky Survey acquired in 10 years. And the Large Hadron Collider is generating many, many petabytes. Um, every hour, and they throw most of it away, but they'll still keep petabytes of data a year. So if you like, the Cosmic Genome Project was the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which surveyed a high-resolution telescope automatically serving a quarter of the night sky, uh, and they had uh, spectra as well as images. They had 2.5 terapixels, 40 terabytes, 120 terabytes when you've done the processing. So it's a large amount of data at the time, and uh, it finished a couple of years ago. And it's an interesting thing. It had about 300 million galaxies. There's only about 10,000 astronomers. And when uh, the experiment of making the data public, putting it on a server that anybody can access, it turns out a lot of people are interested in looking at star pictures. So it had something like 400 million web hits and a million users where there's only a 10,000 or so professional astronomers. So it's used for research, it's also used for high schools and so on. But it's an interesting paradigm in scientific publishing in that you publish the data before you do the analysis because there's so much data you can't look at all the galaxies and so the data is there and you can choose to go and do your analysis on the data after the data is published. So it's an interesting inversion of the usual way. So. Uh, my colleague Jim Gray, who alas is no longer with us, he disappeared three years ago now, uh, uh, used to talk about how each field was developing two subfields like uh, biology, you have computational biology which runs computational models and so on, generates lots of data that way, but also bioinformatics like the genomics revolution and uh, uh, you, obviously chemistry, you have computational chemistry and chemoinformatics and similarly uh, I've seen astroinformatics conferences now and even archaeo informatics so the researchers are faced with different types of problems with all this data uh, you know you've got to take the data in you've got to 
manage large amounts of data, you've got to put a schema, how you organize it, how you share it, uh, how you query it, how you visualize it, a whole different set of skills. And Jim used to like to talk about the emergence of a fourth research paradigm. So we know about experimental science, theoretical science, and in the last 60 years, since we've had um, electronic computers, we <coughs> computational science, you can't do research on climate change, for example, without doing some simulation, similarly with galaxy formation or black hole collisions. Again, you, need, you can't do experiments in the normal way, you do computational experiments. And Ken Wilson, a Nobel Prize winner in 1970, um, uh, talked about this as the third paradigm, because to do this, you need to train people to do algorithms, numerical methods, parallel computers, programming languages, and so on, which are different things than the sort of uh, things you normally brought up to do in experimental and theoretical science. But, of course, it doesn't replace it, it supplements it. And similarly, Jim believed that data-intensive science, where you're now having to have different skills for organizing, managing, and communicating, and this is what the e-science agenda, and Jim called that the fourth paradigm. So uh, that's what I mean by data-intensive science, and I worked on the UK e-science program, which was trying to develop tools and technologies to help people to share, to collaborate, to manage, uh, and so on, and curate and, and, and preserve the data. Uh, just to give you an example of e-science, so it's, 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 it's collaborative, so computer science technologies like machine learning, for example, a whole bag of tricks that computer scientists have uh, for picking up subtle signals in large amounts of data. Uh, Microsoft, my, my project team, are looking at HIV AIDS, trying to develop a vaccine by looking at subtle ways of, of detecting immune responses to the HIV virus and identifying weak spots on the virus where you might attack it. We're looking at other diseases like asthma and diabetes and have found some interesting features and subsets of those diseases. And we're also looking with Brazil at uh, looking at the sugarcane genome to see if you can re-engineer that to uh, be more efficient at producing ethanol. So, I mean, this is how computer science actually and scientists can come together uh, and, uh, again, using these sophisticated techniques for mining the data with the scientists who know what the data is about, you can really make some advances. So, to me, that's very exciting. You need different ways of visualizing it. Uh, Worldwide Telescope is one. Uh, this is a project with two astronomers and, and two people from my team. And, and actually, you look at all different types of data. I talked about the Sloan data, which is in the visible, but there's also infrared, ultraviolet, gamma ray, uh, X-ray, and so on. And you can look at the, the cosmos in all these different uh, ways of looking at it, compare, and it's a wonderful experience. Uh, both for the general public and we hope also as a, a serious tool for astronomers. Um, I've talked about science. I just thought I'd give one example from uh, the humanities. The humanities are not immune from having lots of digital data. They will want to preserve it. They will want to have reproducibility and so on. And uh, if I can see if I can do this. Okay. So this is a, a ChronoZoom. It was developed by Walter Alvarez. Alvarez uh, was the person who postulated the death of the dinosaurs by a meteorite uh, and checked with the iridium deposits to show that was likely to be the case. Uh, what he wants to do now is this big history agenda where you actually try and capture uh, not only um, geological timescales but biological timescales, human timescales, in a way that, that you can look at all sorts of different ways of looking at history. So this is his uh, uh, demo site which we developed with him, looking at from the Big Bang, which is here, and we are on this slide where just a sliver of, perhaps a tiny sliver of paper at the other side, that would be the whole of human history. So how do you actually go and look at that? Well, let, we can go and look at the Big Bang, so you can actually zoom in and, and look in the Big Bang in some depth. You can go back and look at the cosmic history, and you can go and see when the, when the Earth was formed and the planets and so on, and this, this is if you're look, looking at this sort of production of continental crust and you can look at the various events, the climate, how the climate and the atmosphere developed and so on. And you can look at human prehistory, which is, again, a very tiny piece of this figure. Okay, so that's, that's the human when people emerged from, from, from the 
biological evolution. And then you can look at human history. <laughs> okay. So there are interesting things you can do. Uh, and it's just interesting to go back and watch that disappear away. Yes, that's where we are, and the rest of it is that. So it's, it's new ways of visualizing data is, is really kind of fun. Okay, that's enough of that. Uh, but it is, it is really exciting, and we're looking at um, a number of things in that space, and we're hoping to make... I don't really need to know my, my REI connections. Uh, I should have turned it off, shouldn't I? Okay, so that's the big history agenda, and it's really exciting, and we're trying to work with them. Um, it's one of Bill Gates' passions. Uh, and new ways of looking at data. Um, Victoria knows well, because we've been at various things at, in, in DC, uh, they twisted my arm by uh, asking Dan Atkins uh, if he would edit, be, be a chair of this data task force for the Office of Cyber Infrastructure. And they said, Tony's agreed to do it, if you'll do it. And they said to me, Dan's agreed to do it, if you'll do it, all right? And I fell for that. I should have known better, all right? After all this time, I should. Anyway, so we eventually did this thing, uh, uh, Data Task Force. And the, uh, I'll explain why it's um, particularly important at this time in a moment. But this is the uh, report that was produced in March, uh, finally accepted. And what there is a great interest now in the, all the funding agencies in what to do with the public data sets that they generate. Well, the, the data sets that they fund, all right? and how, whether it should be made public or not. And so we looked into six main areas, infrastructure delivery, culture and sociological change, which I think is one of the biggest barriers, including universities, of course. Roles and responsibilities, is it the researcher? Is it the agency? Is it the librarian? Uh, economic value, you know, why are you doing this? Is it worthwhile? We can't save everything. It's cheaper to go and run the experiment again. Well, you can't do that with everything. Like if you're looking at temperatures in the Pacific for the last 20 years, you can't repeat the experiments. Uh, data and management guidelines, NSF now are asking for this. What the hell does that mean? How do you do that? Scientists don't really know what that means. Uh, and then there's also ethics, privacy, intellectual property. So infrastructure delivery, it, it, it does seem irresponsible of agencies just to give the money and then not care what happens with the data. It's public data, publicly funded. So the question is, what's the balance to get, to get right? And they don't usually make any funding allocation. They give you funding allocation to do something exciting, but they don't tell you, give you funding to, to, to curate the data, put the metadata, make it available in a way that other people could use it. And there's no reward for doing that. So the culture, again, how do you actually reward people for putting data in, 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 in a way that other people could use it? And we'll see. Why would you want other people to use it? Why would other people want to use it? Those are also issues. So those are some of the things we picked up. Um, and these are the sort of players that you could imagine, um, from the principal investigator, uh, the libraries, uh, the agencies, commercial service providers. All these people have a, have a stake in, in, in some of part of this agenda. Uh, economic value, data management guidelines, ethics and problems. And, and things like, um, if we're serious about uh, giving credit to, to, to people who do data. How do you cite data? And there's a, an organization called DataCite trying to establish this. And this is one of the initiatives, which I think is an interesting one. Similarly, ORCID is, is trying to remove the ambiguity about authors. So there's a lot of activity around this, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. So those are things that um, are, if you like, the backdrop. Let me talk a little bit then about sharing research data. Why would you want to do it? Well, this was in uh, last year. This is from the Office of Management and Budget. And it goes out to all agencies. And it's a couple of pages. And uh, they tell, you, tell the agencies what they should focus on, in this case, for the tw 2012 budget. These are the key things. And the number of paragraphs. This is just one paragraph. But normally, you know, things like scientific data get one couple of words mentioned. Here we have a whole paragraph, and it says, agencies, in cooperation with OSTP and Office of Management and Budget, should develop and sustain data sets to better document federal science, technology, and innovation investments, and to make these data open to the public in accessible, useful formats. Agencies should develop and regularly update their data sharing policies for research performers, and 
This creates incentives for sharing data publicly in interoperable formats to ensure maximum value consistent with privacy, national security, and confidentiality concerns. So all the agencies, Department of Energy, NIH, NSF, got the same uh, 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 instruction, if you like, from the Office of Management Budget in the White House. And I think that was one of the reasons why NSF was so keen to have a data task force, because they got this directive. Um, in 2010, also, NSF um, decided to get serious about its data sharing policy. This is its data sharing policy. Investigators are expected to share with each other, each, with other researchers, at no more than incremental cost and within a reasonable time, the primary data, samples, physical collections, and other supporting materials created or gathered in the course of work under NSF grants. Grantees are expected to encourage and facilitate such sharing. So that's what you're supposed to do when you apply for NSF grants in the US. Uh, all future proposals now require you to have a data management plan. They didn't give you any guidance as to what that was, where will you put the data, who's going to look after it in the long term, 20 years from now. Lots of issues, but uh, the plan in this case for NSF will be subject to peer review. NSF and NIH has had something similar for a long time, but the plan you give is not subject to peer review. So this is slightly different from NIH. So that's the reason why I think the agencies are so focused. That's the reason uh, reproducible research is sort of sitting in the background there. But reproducible research is a very complicated thing, as I'm sure you all know. So I would like to um, recommend this paper by Chris Borgman at UCLA called about the conundrum of sharing research data. Uh, she refers to an NSB report, Long Live Digital Data Collections 2005, where they identified four categories of data, and it's different for different types of data. Obviously, the observational data, like the temperature of the Pacific 20 years ago, you can't repeat it. So, you know, what does reproducible mean in that sense? Uh, computational data, that's simulations and all that sort of stuff. Experimental data, well, again, there are small-scale people who you know, measure, for example, bacterial contamination on the beaches here, uh, and, and they do their little experiments, but you're not going to get their samples of data. So, actually, what's it mean to, 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 to prepare samples, as you saw in that sort of Office of Management and Budget guidelines? How do you share those? Is it worth it? You know? Uh, again, what's it mean? And then there's all sorts of types of records. So those were the things identified in the NSB report, and Chris Borgman talks a lot more about what's meant by data and what these particular issues are, and I do recommend the paper. Um, she also identifies four reasons why you might want to share data, which is where we come to uh, reproducible research. Well, to reproduce or to verify the research. I was at the University of Southampton, in England. I was head of computer science and dean of engineering. And the most cited paper from Southampton, you know what it was? It was cold fusion, all right? Widely believed to be wrong, uh, but it's certainly the most cited paper. Uh, and no one was able to reproduce it, but, you know, uh, there was a larger uh, debate as to whether people had done it right and so on. But in the end, when nobody's seen the same effect, you eventually believe that it's, it's spurious. So, what does reproducibility mean? What's it mean to verify research? It's only applicable to some types of data and some types of research. And again, you need to be clear, uh, you know, what the culture of the field is. I think you, you have to do it with the input of the scientists. You can't just give it as a directive uh, across all the fields. A friend of mine runs the uh, British Atmospheric Data Center and he says he doesn't want to create a worn archive, write once, read never. There's no point in doing that. So you have to actually engage the scientists as to what they think uh, is the subset of data you need to keep uh, for 20 years or for 50 years or whatever. So that's one reason she gives. She gives another one, she analyzes publicly funded research, we paid for it, we should have access to it. And that's obvious if you like in the case of treatments for cancer, treatments for uh, disease, then there's a clear public benefit. People want to know. You have some disease. You'd like to know what people at latest research is doing. Public money is for public good, and so on. And things like citizen science is appropriate in some areas. And again, you can get um, uh, 
I think it's important to engage the public since they pay for it. So if you can find good examples of that, that's a, a good thing. So the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is one such example. And then can you get new results? So you've got some data sets. And if you can combine them with your data set, you've just taken, maybe you can get more out of those data sets with your data set and new results, new research, and accelerate the research process. So if you like scientific data mashups. And again, those I think are going to be important. But again, things like formats and interoperability and all this sort of stuff, they, a lot of things to work out. And again, I think it's done, you know, in, it has to be decided by the community, the particular research community. What, what I'm more interested in is that, you know, the more I go around to seeing how people do, for example, bioinformatics research, it's just hugely complex and hugely complicated. Uh, uh, and in, in PubMed, uh, two papers are deposited per minute throughout the year. How can you keep up with two papers a minute? Nobody can read that. So the question is, we reproduce, we, 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 we duplicate, all sorts of inefficiencies. People do things that people others have done. And, and how can we communicate? How can we make things more efficient? I think that's important to accelerate how we, you know, defeat AIDS, how we actually go and do something to mitigate climate change and so on. So just some examples again from our uh, data task force report. This one I liked, all right, so this um, scientists uh, off the coast of Maine have been collecting high frequency radar data that can remotely measure ocean currents uh, off New England. And by making this available, uh, it's now available to the U.S. Coast Guard, and they've historically used on, uh, on charts and wind gauges to figure out if you had a ship lost or people overboard, where they would drift to, but they found it's much more accurate to use this data. So that was not anticipated when these scientists were doing that, but suddenly it's been picked up by the Coast Guard, and they find it very useful and more efficient to save lives. So unexpected uses of the data, if you make it available. I like this quote from... Uh, uh, Professor Schofield, a large fraction of the data the Rutgers team collects has to be thrown out because there's no room to store it and no support within existing research projects to better curate and manage the data. I can get funding to put equipment into the ocean, but not to analyze that data on the back end. And that's indicative of, of, of some of the times when you have this small-scale science where there isn't funding to do the sort of management of data. Big science like astronomy and particle physics, there's usually a big multi-million budget where there is a, a sort of set aside for software and data curation and stuff like this. But small science, this is obviously often neglected. So uh, that's one of the culture changes that we were calling for. Um, I talked about citizen science. This is uh, using, again, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. There are 300 million galaxies there. Can you get the general public to help you classify them? Uh, are they elliptical, spiral, do they go left hand, uh, anti-clockwise or clockwise and so on? Uh, and so they had hundreds of thousands, probably near the 300,000 individuals signed up and they actually have made some serious discoveries and serious scientific papers. Uh, there's a thing called Hannes Vorwerp and there's also a whole new class of galaxies called green pea, they look like little green peas, green pea galaxies. And this is Hannes Vorwerp, this blue thing here. Um, was seen by a Dutch school teacher called Hanny van Arkel, and um, uh, it's now believed to be uh, an interesting, unique, so far, galaxy, and Alex Saleh has got Hubble space time to go and analyze exactly what's going on there. So people can make discoveries, and that's really, uh, I think, something that's important politically, but also, I think, a general good. And making the data available in the sense that the public good is one of the reasons there. This is a mashup, if you like, so, uh, but using historical data from Landsat along with um, data on, 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 on water uh, wells. So it, this is in, I think, uh, in, in the Dakotas. Um, they changed the pattern of crop rotation. It used to be go from, uh, uh, used to go from corn to soy to corn. Uh, and that's, the corn is yellow, obviously, in the soy, and so you could see each year it changed. But when they changed the policy to make it more advantageous to grow corn, uh, they didn't rotate anymore. Now, that had an unexpected side effect, 
that corn, to grow corn, you need hundreds times more nitrogen fertilizer than you do to do soy. And as a result, the water wells are getting poisoned and becoming uh, uh, contaminated. And so by actually correlating this data with the water well data, you can show what the cost of that policy is. So an unexpected, uh, you know, you, you say it's good to have corn to, to make ethanol, yes, but there are costs associated. One of the costs is you have to go to something to mitigate the water well contamination. So uh, the USGS, we're talking about the value of VOI, not return on investment, the value of information. So this is some way of, of showing that there is some monetary value in these sort of scientific mashups. Um, and what about making research more efficient? Well, this is one example. There are a couple of examples like this. And this is unusual because it's in the biomedical community where they don't typically share data before publication. So this is the Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging initiative, which is about 14 different data centers uh, collecting data um, on patients with early Alzheimer's. Uh, and they agreed in advance that they would put their data in a common place and share it before they'd analyzed it. Uh, and initially, that was a big culture change and people didn't want to do it. But when some people started doing it, other people felt they had to do it. And then it, it suddenly became very quickly. Uh, and data was now typically made available within a week of being collected. And so hundreds of thousands of scientists have now made tens of thousands of downloads from their website. And of the, the several dozen papers using this, a good percentage have been authored by researchers who weren't involved in taking the data. And so that does actually show you can get more value out of your data if you share. But I think these are not many examples of these type of sharing, but this is an example of the benefits of doing that. Oh, yeah, the topic of the, the conference, reproducible research. But the reason I've done this, I think it's a, it's reproducible research covers a large area. It isn't just, uh, it's about how you create, how you save it, and, and all these other things. But we did do a project with Jill Mezirov of the Broad Institute on reproducible research. So she has a publication which I recommend in Science uh, Policy Forum about accessible reproducible research. What it was, was um, she was authoring their papers in Word, Sorry, if you've got Macs, you have to run Windows. You can dual boot it, so it's OK. You can, uh, because these add-ins uh, actually require the, the word on, on, on Windows, unfortunately. Not, we haven't yet got a Mac version, but you can do it uh, dual boot. Um, so what we did was uh, you have your paper, you have some data in it, and you'd like if you're reading it or if you're, you're updating it, you'd like to go to the database and see if the data's been updated. You could run it again. Maybe I'd run it with different parameters. And you want to capture what's been done to that data. And so that's the actual um, way you'd like to do. Um, the provenance is stored within the document because it's all in XML. Uh, you can go and see what pipelines, the sort of workflow you've put together, and you connect to the particular database. So that one. Let's see if this works. It did earlier on, but I didn't get any speech. OK. Does this work? If not, I'll have to give the commentary. I thought there would be good bandwidth connections at UBC. No clear connection to a gene pattern server is required and has already been established. Then scroll to an image in the document with which you would like to associate your gene pattern pipeline. Select the image and from the gene pattern tab select Associate Pipeline. This will bring up the Associate Pipeline panel where you can choose which pipelines to associate with the image from those pipelines run by your user on the gene pattern server to which the atom is connected. Then name and describe the association. You can also select a primary result and to stop them before oh, yeah. saving the association. Once all the details are configured, save the association. When the association is complete, 
You can verify its success by opening the dashboard. I'm sorry, it's missing up. There's a whole tab across the top. And they were the This includes all pipelines and modules and module input files. The document can now be saved and passed to a client or viewer. The new reader can now select the Game Pattern tab and then the dashboard to select and scroll through the image containing all of the pipeline associations in which they are interested. Via the details of that association, select the associations. From here, the reader can rerun the pipeline previously associated with the image. So, let me just see if I can do better than that. Uh, there should be a should be able to see that uh, control panel. Let's change the setting. Honest, it worked before, but I changed the resolution. Which is really foolish of me. But I would like you to see this because. To begin using the gene pattern, reproducible research document add-in, select the gene pattern tab. So this is the tab. Now that the connection to the gene pattern server is required, it has already been established. Then scroll to an image in the document with which you would like to associate your gene pattern pipeline. Select the image, and from the gene pattern tab, select the associate pipeline. This will bring up the associate pipeline panel, where you can choose which pipeline to associate with the image or those pipelines run from your user on the gene pattern server to which the add is connected. Then name and describe the association. You can also select a primary result and a stop point before saving the association. Once all the details are configured, save the association. When the association is complete, you can verify its success by opening the dashboard. Is this a model of the the and the and module input files. The document can now be saved and passed to a column or viewer. The new reader can now select the gene pattern tab and then the dashboard to select and scroll to the image containing all of the pipeline associations in which they are interested. To use the details of that association, select the associations. From here, the reader can rerun the pipeline previously associated with the image. Before launching a rerun, the reader can select a new stop point and configure any available pipeline parameters or leave them as they will in the original. Here the only configurable parameters are the input files, and they will be left unaltered for the rerun. From this panel, the reader can also view the summary and choose the gene pattern server on which to launch the rerun. Once the rerun is configured, select rerun to start the job in the selected gene pattern server. When the job is finished, the pipeline result can be reviewed, saved, or inserted into the document. The reader may choose to insert just the files selected or all result files in order to insert input files into the rerun. The inserted results will appear in a new section at the end of the document. This section will include the name of the pipeline, the time of the run, comments provided by the user, pipeline parameters, and the pipeline results chosen for insert. This allows any other user to reproduce that same rerun or the original run of the pipeline using the word document. So that's what I wanted to say. That's the only reason that I. Is worth doing. It was actually a nice thing, and I think it deserves what Jill did, deserves a bit more publicity. Uh, but that's in a field where it does make sense to allow you to go do those sort of things. So let me just go back here. Okay, so um, that was something we built with her using her particular database, which is called Gene Pattern, going from their document to Gene Pattern. So they, the author can suddenly change, they've changed the data, they'd like to change the table. Or a reader could say, well, I'd like to see what they did. Maybe I want to do something different on their same data. And so it can be used by either the user or the author. So the data is sort of at their server. The, the data is the server. The workflows, however, are embedded in the document. So the, the actual links to the workflows. And, and is the processing done on the server or, or on the local machine? Uh, uh, I think in this case, the processing done on the server. But I suspect you could have a choice, right? So 
That was a rather special purpose thing we did for Jill, uh, and uh, she wrote it up, and I do think it's an interesting thing because it does show, in this case, that's reproducible in the sense that you capture the provenance, you say yeah, what, what's been done, and you can allow people to do different things. Supporting the data life cycle then, however, that's just a piece of the puzzle, and this is a IWGDD, Interagency Working Group on Digital Data. So that was the NSF, DOE, uh, NIH. They were told to get together and decide what they do, and this is the plan they came up with. They gave me this thing, I'm not quite sure what that is, but this is some sort of, um, not a great diagram, is it? I don't find it particularly useful, but that was the one they used, so I used it. I have a different version, which is sort of linear, but they like the circular one. <laughs> Hmm? It looks like Greek physics. Yes, it does. No, it's, 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 it looks like a Plato's model of the universe or whatever it is. Anyway, well, that's what they used. But, but, um, so the one we did for, for Jill Mezirov was very specific. It was actually uh, a, a, a specially bespoke thing. But this is actually a plug-in, uh, an open source tool that we made, uh, which is actually a generic workflow system, which you can embed in your document, all right? So here you have a number of things. You can execute and monitor workflows. You can view the performance metrics, provenance data, actual data products. You can modify various things. It's probably too sophisticated, in my view, for the average user. Right? And I would have liked to have uh, um, something that linked to the sort of standard workflow engines that other people are using, give people a choice. So I'm not sure this is quite right. Uh, we're working with Beth Playley in the University of Indiana. She's been using this for atmospheric projects. The question is, could we do better? So that's the workflow engine we've produced, which is generic. It's open source. It's available. Um, whether it's what you want, I'm not 100% clear. And this is the other thing which we have not yet released, but we could release, all right? Um, again, as open source, a plug-in. And unfortunately, the plug-in doesn't work with Mac Office. It has to have Windows Office, but you'll have to dual boot your Macs. Right. But again, it has this dashboard. Uh, you can embed a Trident workflow package inside the Word document because it's all XML associated with an image or some text. You can view the inputs and outputs uh, of an embedded workflow. You can rerun to produce results while remaining in the Word application. So this is the sort of essence of what Jill, as I just showed you what Jill has done. This is, in, es in essence, is a more generic thing. Now, we haven't actually taken it further. Um, because I actually firmly believe you have to do things that academics find useful. So if people think this is a useful tool, then we can actually go and uh, extend it further. It's open source. You can, you can partner with us. You can do it yourselves. You don't have to pay any attention to us. You can port it to other systems like OpenOffice. More difficult, actually, because it hasn't got the, the XML uh, feature uh, so easily implemented. But, but you could do. So you could take this open source code and do it whenever platform you like. So the question is, is there demand for doing something like this? And uh, you know, that's really one of the things I'd be interested to hear from you about. Do you have some examples? You say that this is a generalization of what you did with Joe I, I have not an example of this being used by any other. I, I'm working with Bleth Playley because I believe that these open source add-ins should be owned by the community. If they're useful, they'll be taken up. If they're not, People shouldn't use them. So, you know, that's a fairly straightforward in my view. So we'd like to see if we can produce things that make, you know, uh, if I ignore computer scientists and physicists who all write in LaTeX, a lot of people write in Word, right? So can we make Word and Excel more useful to scientists? I don't know, but that's what we're trying to do. Right? Uh, and so we have a number of add-ins. Um, you just maybe sign a Creative Commons thing. We have, you can put, this is a Creative Commons plugin on all your PowerPoints and all your uh, Word documents. You can add a Creative Commons thing and uh, it's available. Uh, we also have author, authoring, author, or article authoring add-ins. Yes, sorry. Uh, so uh, if you do the National Library of Medicine, they have a particular format they want you to do. And you can, as you're writing it, you can put it in the National Library of Medicine DTD. Uh, format where you have title, author, and so on. And you, can, you can actually annotate your document as you're creating it by using these plugins. So that's one way of doing it. We're also working with the Public Library of Science and trying to do something interesting. So there's a number of things you can do. And again, those are things we could extend, or you could extend, we could extend together uh, if, if it's useful. Again, it's an open source add-in. 
Uh, and for biologists, uh, I'm sure you know, biologists like ontologies, right? Uh, and so when you're in your Word document, it makes much more sense if you, the author, tag the items in your document with words from the specific ontology that's relevant to your paper. And that's what this is intended. So this was with Phil Bourne and Lynn Fink in San Diego. And again, that's an open source plugin that we can extend. We could do other things. Uh, what we're doing at the moment uh, with the NSF Data One project and with the California Digital Library, we're looking at a, a, a data curation add-in for Microsoft Excel. And these are some of the features that we might actually implement. Uh, these slides will be available so you can look at these later on. I know it's too small to read. And finally, you want to store it. So we've been playing around. Uh, I happen to believe that, um, I don't know if you all saw the amazing, to me, collaboration between Google, Yahoo, and Microsoft with schema.org. It was an agreed set of vocabularies for people to mark up their their, their web pages with some semantic data. Actually, it's a little vocabulary. Semantics probably too, too strong a word. But it means that if I'm now looking, I'm looking for Casablanca, right? Now, the computer has no idea whether I'm in Casablanca the town or Casablanca the movie. But actually, from the context of my search, it's obvious. And the computer, if it has knowledge that this is a Casablanca town, this is a Casablanca movie, um, specified by these micro formats, which is what schema.org does, uh, you have the beginnings of semantic computing and uh, towards somewhat semantic web, but without the sort of heavyweight ontologies and RDF and, and, and OWL and all that sort of stuff. But this is a, a, a way that you can actually store data in a database, it happens to be just SQL Server, a relational database, uh, but using something like, very like RDF, you can actually annotate that. And we've been doing things with the universities in Bogota and with the Economic and Social Research Council in the UK, where you put in the date, uh, uh, all the publications, and you can put a sort of annotations on it and, it's, and relationships between these things. And it, it, again, I think it's rather exciting because I happen to believe that repositories for subject repositories or institutional repositories are an important part of this open uh, science, open access world. Okay. Uh, last, last thing on that, and then I'll shut up. Uh, Microsoft finally has followed IBM's example of setting up an open source foundation as one of the partners and giving some intellectual property to it, and then it's hands off. So we have set up a foundation called the Outer Curve Foundation, which we sponsor. I'm on the board. Uh, there are five people on the board, two Microsoft, so we're outvoted. Uh, if, you know, it's not ours. We don't control this. And, and it really uses proper open source licenses that everybody would recognize as an open source. And what we're trying to do is actually make it possible for, for people from industry, like Microsoft people, to go and work on open source projects without jeopardizing the IP of the company they work with. So this is what Mozilla did when they, they spun out of Netscape. Uh, they set up a foundation eventually because it became very confusing. If you're working for Netscape, do they own the IP or does it the Mozilla Foundation? Well, here, the Outer Curve Foundation owns it because they didn't have a foundation originally in Mozilla. That's why they set up a foundation. The same thing here. So my team can go and work and collaborate with academic researchers to go and extend those add-ins in other ways. And this is a, 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 they have a metaphor of a gallery, so there's various galleries. We, my group, sponsor the Research Accelerators Gallery, where we have the workflow tool is in there under, I think it's a, an Apache 2 license. Um, we also have a chemistry add-in for Word. We have Conference XP. So, and we're hoping we'll put more things in there. Uh, they're all under open source, but they're not yet committed to here, and we hope we will get more in there. So this is chemistry for Word, where it sounds trivial. You can type a chemical equation in Word, but because we put some semantic information using chemical markup language, when you type CH4, the computer has enough knowledge to know that the C is a carbon atom and the H of are four hydrogens, and it can say, do you want to call it methane, do you want to call it CH4, or do you want the chemical structure of, of whatever it is? So it, it's the beginning, if you like, of semantic chemistry. Right, I better shut up. So the last two slides I want to show uh, are slides from two people that I inherited. I joined Microsoft in 2005, and to my surprise, 
This was a slide that Bill Gates showed, supercomputing in November uh, 2005, uh, envisaging a new era. This is, a slide, this is the slide he used, a new era of research reporting. And you notice reproducible research is right there. Uh, uh, interactive data, dynamic documents, different ways of peer review, reputation influence, and obviously collaboration. So, I mean, that's the vision that I share, and I was given that vision, surprisingly, by Bill Gates. I think it was written by my, my boss, Craig Monday, actually, in the slides. But nonetheless, it was, I think, uh, most of us would subscribe to something like this. And, and uh, links to my passion for open access, because uh, when I was Dean of Engineering, uh, I was supposed to monitor the output of my 200 faculty and 300 grad students and postdocs. And how could I do that when the university library doesn't have enough budget to subscribe to all the journals that my staff publish in? So we insisted them putting them in, keeping a digital copy on campus. That's what you have to do, right? And uh, I think it's very important. Okay, uh, and then this is Jim Gray's last talk, two weeks before he died. This is his vision of the future, and it's a vision that I sort of share. Uh, where literature will be available because we no longer need the printing press. We can do all sorts of clever things if, it, if it's actually electronic, as you saw in the previous slide. Um, but we also need at least some of the data, you know, exactly how much data, how you do it. That's a, that's a complicated thing, varies from field to field, scale to scale. And then there's the possibility of combining it with mashups, putting it together, uh, and actually making something which is more than the sum of the parts. And so I think it's a very exciting thing because I really believe this will increase the scientific uh, velocity, this will increase the, the productivity, and make science a little more efficient at actually solving some of the problems facing the world. So for this, this is an exciting vision, and that's what my group and Microsoft Research is, is trying to enable for people who want to use our stuff. If they don't want to use our stuff, that's fine. But I'd like to make our stuff interoperable. You have a choice. You can use this. You can use that. And you shouldn't use our stuff unless it does something that works for you. But uh, that's what we're trying to do. And if you have suggestions as to what we should be doing, I'd be happy to. I'll be around all day. I have to go and listen to Victoria's talk. But then I have to disappear. Right? So, but I'm around all day. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. My kids did IT in schools. They did a different course. They, it was changed every year, and it was the most boring course they did the whole of their academic right. career. My suggestion should be that it should be tied to scientific activity, and that you should have, if you like, computational classics that kids can work through so that they all have some common understanding of what... We can clearly do a... Why don't we talk in the break, because that's something I care about, uh, and... Yeah, I think we should do a much better job. So I, I, I absolutely concur with that. Yeah, I have a question. Um, you're talking about how science is changing, experimental, theoretical science, computational science, and now data and for science. I was sort of seeing, what do you think about where computer science is? And, you know, are we even ready to tackle this data intensive science, or is that something? No, that, really that's why I, I deliberately yeah. showed the example of machine learning okay. applied to some problems. So we are using. And, and that's what my e-science program in the UK was. It was actually, I, I had money uh, to bribe computer scientists to work with scientists. And, the sci and they only got the money if they agreed to talk to each other. And of course, the first six months, typically, it was very interesting. You know, they talked past each other. The scientists didn't know what computer science is. They don't have no idea what computer science is. They think we like programs, you know? Well, we do, but not particularly well, maybe. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, we thought, oh, there's their problem. I've got this great tool that will fix their problems. But, of course, it doesn't because it doesn't fit with their way of working. It's only a piece of the puzzle. And it took at least six months before they actually 
least began to talk. It didn't happen in all the projects. But so I think there's an understanding, and, and that's why I'm sympathetic with about part of the motivation. I think it's really important to get people looking at STEM and ICT and, and, and these sort of things. Uh, and I think using science can help. And I think computer science has a great opportunity to show all the clever things that we do in computer science. How, I should explain, I'm really a physicist in disguise. Right? But, but I have been 20 odd years in computer science. My colleagues almost regard me as a computer scientist. I haven't been here quite long enough, but almost. So I think there's a great opportunity. And I, I, I think computer scientists, I think A, it's fun. B, you could achieve something worthwhile. And also you've got, you can also get good things. The computer scientists in the UK who work with them suddenly started looking at provenance, and, and it's, a, it's an interesting research project. How do you also store data for 20 years that's captured in a spreadsheet? You know, spreadsheets have all these calculations behind them. So I can guarantee in 20 years that version of the spreadsheet won't exist, the version of the, uh, the hardware and the operating system won't exist. So what does it mean to preserve a, a spreadsheet? So there are real problems for computer science. And, you know, so I think they can cross-fertilize. So I, I'm, but I'm an enthusiast. Right. Right. Okay, well, thanks, thanks a lot for listening.